Hi, everyone, and welcome. Thank you for joining us for today's Meet the Analyst webinar, Identity Resolution, It's Time to Get Serious About Your Post-Cookie Strategy. I'm your host, Evelyn Mitchell, Senior Analyst at Insider Intelligence based in Virginia. And I'm joined by my colleague, Paul Verna, Principal Analyst, who is in New York. Hi, Paul. Hey, Evelyn. It's great to have you here. Thank you. Uh, before we get to the main presentation, I'd like to thank Axiom for making today's webinar possible and welcome Kyle Holloway, Senior Vice President and Head of Global Identity at Axiom. Kyle is joining us from Little Rock, Arkansas. Hi, Kyle. Hey, Evelyn. Thanks for having us today. So happy you're here. A few things before we dive in. We have a ton of information to share, but there's no need to take notes if you'd rather not. We will email you a link to view the slides and the full recording of today's presentation afterwards. But we do want you to participate. Just use the chat window to the right of the video feed to submit any questions at any time throughout the presentation. And we will get to as many as we can during the Q&A at the end of the session. So with that, Paul, take it away. Well, thanks, Evelyn, and thanks to Kyle and the folks at Axiom for supporting this webinar, and thank you to everyone who's tuning in today. So before I run through the agenda, I just want to start with a few quick words about identity resolution, what it is, why it's important, and how we're covering it this year. So at its core, identity resolution is the process of identifying individual users across a wide range of digital and physical touch points. The availability of third-party browser cookies and mobile ID, uh, IDs really streamlined that process, but now that those identifiers are either gone or on the chopping block, everybody who buys, sells, or facilitates transactions around programmatic ads needs to work that much harder to make sure they understand who they're targeting. And make no mistake, the extension of Google's self-imposed deadline to phase out Chrome and Android IDs is really not a save by the bell moment. It's more of a delay in an inevitable scenario that's already well underway with cookie deprecation in the Apple ecosystem and elsewhere. So in other words, no one should let down their guard and assume that they have time to play with. When it comes to ID resolution, the future is now. And as far as how we're covering it, we're doing two reports this year that look at the identity landscape. And we're also factoring in identity-related coverage in all of our related coverage on programmatic and privacy and, and right across the board. So we're really trying to stay on top of um, uh, a very dynamic part of the industry. So with that preamble out of the way, here is the agenda for today. I'm going to start with a look at the dollars around ID resolution, how much is spent on ID services and related technologies, and more broadly, what the economics of programmatic advertising look like according to our current forecasts. I'll talk about the state of readiness for the cookie-less future. This is a moving target as the ID phase out gets closer to actually happening. And we have some new data to share on this aspect of the transition. I'll give a snapshot of the ID landscape and spoiler alert, it's a vast, complex and fragmented picture. I'll share some views on what success will look like in this next phase of programmatic advertising. I'll delve into a topic that hasn't gotten a ton of attention, uh, maybe not as much as it should or as much as it likely will, and that is the prospect of IP addresses going the way of cookies and mobile IDs. I'll wrap up with some best practices, and as always, I'll be happy to answer any questions that come in during the presentation, and I know Evelyn and Kyle will also lend their expertise in that Q&A segment. So with that, let's drill down on the rising costs of ID resolution. So I'll start with some fresh data that the Winterberry Group shared with us on the top line costs of ID solutions and services spending in the US. So spending on these services will surpass $10 billion this year, and that's year-over-year -year growth of 13%. That's more than triple the 2018 amount. And some of the drivers behind these increases are digital channel expansion, rising demand for first-party data relationships, uh, and adoption of costly technologies like data clean rooms, which we'll get into. 
So on that topic of clean rooms or DCRs, the IB spent the better part of its 2023 state of data report examining their role, not just in ID resolution, but in targeting and measurement and in data collaboration in a privately uh, privacy compliant way. So according to the IAB, US V2B firms spent an average of $376,000 last year just on DCRs, even more on CMPs, DMPs, ID services, and CDPs. And I know I'm throwing out a lot of acronyms here, but consent management platforms, data management platforms, and customer data platforms all play a role in how to manage and optimize first-party data at a time when it's increasingly important to marketing success. But without going too far down that rabbit hole or alphabet soup of, of the tech paradigms um, that are increasingly important to drive our ROI and programmatic advertising, really the main takeaway is that these services require significant outlays of money. And by the way, the IB estimated that more than four out of five users of DCRs also use CDPs and DMPs, and about half of them also used ID solutions and CMPs. So these costs can be additive once you start layering in multiple technologies. Um, so this cost analysis leads us to our forecasts of programmatic ad spending. So we're estimating top line US programmatic display ad spending north of 145 billion this year. That's a growth factor of over 16% over last year, which as we've seen was not a banner year for digital advertising overall. Um, now I need to mention right off the bat that we're about to update these figures. So we'll have a new forecast in the coming days and weeks that will reflect where things are now. So the specifics might look a little different from what I'm able to show today, but the general pattern should hold. So essentially we're looking at a little bit slower growth rates than what we saw in the years leading up to 2021, which was a banner year for programmatic and digital. But despite this slowdown in growth, we're still looking at healthy year over year increases in the double digits throughout our forecast period. And that brings us to the fees that are associated with programmatic advertising, um, otherwise known as the ad tech tax. So these fees are going to hover around 15 billion in the US this year. So it's a pretty good chunk of money any way you look at it. But as a percentage of real time bidding or RTB ad spending, they're actually going down a little bit, just inching down throughout this forecast. And they should net out at about 42% of RTB spend this year which is down fractionally over 2022 and down by about two percentage points from 2018. So why are these fees decreasing relative to RTB spending? And the answer is simple. A growing share of RTB spending is going toward private marketplaces as opposed to open exchanges. So this results in a slight reduction in the ad tech tax since those private marketplaces are generally organized by invitation and carry somewhat lower fees. So here's what it looks like in chart form. The top line in red is programmatic direct, which we define as ads transacted in non-auction environments via an API. That represents about three quarters of programmatic display inventory in the US. The gray line below is private marketplaces or PMPs. Um, and the black line is open exchanges. So you can see that those two lines, the black and gray, are moving in opposite directions in favor of PMPs, and that's what's driving down those fees slightly lower. Uh, but more importantly, the growing use of PMPs is a reflection on how advertisers are forging relationships with publishers that have first-party data, while also using their own first-party data to inform their programmatic campaigns. This chart also points to the limitations of open exchanges at a time when the identifiers that powered those exchanges are really being phased out and the quality of some of those ad experiences has suffered a bit as a result. Um, and Evelyn, since you just delivered a webinar on programmatic advertising yesterday, and I know you talked through this slide, do you have anything to add here? Uh, you covered most of it. I guess all I will add is um, that heavier use of PMPs doesn't always lead to lower fees. Um, in fact, 
you know, PMPs and programmatic direct often involve a little more of a human touch uh, when it comes to setting up deal parameters, for example, where fee reduction really comes into play is when advertisers audit their programmatic partners to really make sure that any fees are justified, right? That there's a tangible value provided in exchange for those fees. And most of the time, if the value is high, the fee is also high. But fees get reduced when advertisers opt out of partnerships where maybe that value isn't enough to justify the fee, or um, maybe there's just another intermediary that it's kind of hidden along the bid stream um, and it doesn't really provide any discernible value. And amid all of this uncertainty um, in terms of identity resolution and also, you know, general economic outlook, uh, advertisers will continue to trim unnecessary intermediaries in their supply chain and lean into those closed and private ecosystems for all the reasons that you mentioned. Yeah, thanks for um, that additional bit of insight. So let's segue now to uh, talking about how ready marketers and publishers are for the cookie apocalypse. Um, and let me also just say that this um, ID deprecation process has been a very long slog. Um, even if Google sticks to the timeline of eliminating Chrome and Android IDs by the end of next year, as they've said, um, if they push it out even again, e even further, then it'll be an even longer slog, or as David Cohen of the IAB described it, the world's biggest slow motion train wreck. Um, but there are some encouraging signs that we as an industry are making progress toward a future without cookies, uh, or at least a future much less reliant on cookies. So a study by Lodomy found that uh, growing numbers of both marketers and publishers saw uh, ID resolution as an urgent priority in late 2022 compared with a year earlier. Now there's still room for progress considering that less than half of respondents in each group gave the ID issue uh, a level five or level four urgency with the higher numbers being the most urgent. So it's almost inevitable that we'll see those red and black indicators increase as we get closer to game time with the ID phase out. But for now, we can at least say that we're heading in the right direction and marketers and publishers are more aligned than they were in late 2021. So there are some other signs of progress as well. So for instance, a study last fall by ID5 found that almost half of marketers and publishers said they'd have a cookie list strategy in place by the end of 2022. And another 29% said they'd be ready by mid-2023. The rest said they were already there. A separate study by Salesforce found that almost 90% of marketers that used AI in 2022 were relying on the technology to help solve identity conflicts. And we all know that the use of AI across many functions and disciplines is growing by the minute. So it's telling that this technology is being put to use in the service of identity resolution. So I'll share one more item about how attitudes toward ID resolution are changing. And this is a direct quote from Booty Tansy at Experian Marketing Services. So he told us, quote, a year ago, our clients were still trying to understand which cookie list IDs they should be using and what collaboration platforms could mean for them. But now they're like, we have a use case that we want to collaborate on with XYZ partner and we want to test the solution. Okay, now shifting to the identity ecosystem, it is a dizzyingly complex group of players that involves pretty much everyone. I mean, this is kind of a shorthand list of the various participants in programmatic advertising, all of whom have an interest in solving for identity challenges. So you have publishers, and we look at this broadly as any company that sells programmatic ad inventory, whether it's a TV network, a social media platform, a retailer, a CTV content aggregator, or a smart TV manufacturer, um, a video or audio streaming service, game, mobile app developer, a news organization, you name it. Um, marketers are basically any brand that buys programmatic ads, and that can include publishers or media companies that promote their products through ads. So sometimes those lines between buyers and sellers can get a little bit blurred. 
With agencies beyond the traditional agency-client relationship, agencies are more and more important in helping their customers establish um, and hone their programmatic advertising strategies. And this includes ID resolution services and things like campaign optimization, measurement and attribution, and a lot more. When it comes to retailers, we've all seen the explosion of retail media networks. So this space is now a huge part of the programmatic ecosystem. Then you have DSPs. Uh, Winterberry Group found that large percentages of agencies and media owners expected to increase their spending on DSPs in 2022. Uh, on the other side, SSPs, uh, the ID5 study I mentioned earlier found that SSPs are really leaning into universal identifiers, which we'll talk about a little bit more later. Um, you have CTV providers, you have ad exchanges, which facilitate real-time bidding transactions between buyers and sellers, typically through DSPs and SSPs. You have measurement firms. This is a space that's undergoing a lot of testing and learning, especially on the TV and CTV side. In fact, I'd say there's a strong analogy between the erosion of cookies and mobile IDs on the programmatic side and the erosion of a single currency on the TV side. In both cases, there's a sea change that's taking an industry from an imperfect but consensus-based approach, approach to a much more fragmented environment where it's not clear that a single solution will prevail. And then of course you have the ID solution providers. And on that point, there's some 50 firms that offer identity solutions on a global basis per Prohaska Consulting, which does an amazing job of keeping a running tally of these companies. And if you factor in services that operate in specific regions, that number is upwards of 80. Uh, and these providers include tech giants, CTV platforms, social media companies, device makers, and more. Uh, there's also a mix here of deeply entrenched and deep pocketed companies and scrappy startups. So it's a very dynamic market, but it's not really sustainable. We've already seen some consolidation and more is likely to come according to many people we've spoken with. So you combine this intrinsically um, fluid environment with kind of like, um, you know, a, a backdrop of economic headwinds and rising interest rates and the, the very well publicized struggles of some of the bellwether companies in the digital ad space. And you really have a recipe for a lot of friction and likely more M&A activity in this space. So as all this is happening, uh, everybody's kind of playing a guessing game as to what Google's going to do. But this much is is clear. We are unmistakably in a more privately uh, privacy centric era, and this timeline shows some of the major events in the deprecation of third party identifiers in the name of privacy. Starting with what I think most of us consider the opening salvo, which was the introduction of the GDPR in Europe in 2016. Since then, you have Apple, Mozilla, and Google all taking steps toward promoting consumer privacy in one way or another, whether it's blocking cookies or cross-site tracking by default, or in Google's case, creating the privacy sandbox and coming up with a timeline for ID deprecation. And it might be hard to make out the details in this graphic, but two of the entries in the bottom row refer to that kicking the can down the road by Google. So I'm sure we'll, hearing, we'll be hearing more about that soon, but in the meantime, it's never too early or too late to consider what success will look like in a post-cookie world. So let's start with universal IDs. So that slow phase out of legacy identifiers has sparked a gold rush of company and industry-led proposals for universal IDs. And these IDs include probabilistic data, deterministic data, or both. And solutions also vary based on the environments where they're deployed, with some focusing on web browsers and others on mobile devices. But the common denominator is interoperability, or at least a push to sign up a critical mass of partners across the programmatic supply chain. So we have things like the Trade Desk's uh, UID 2.0, LiveRamp's RampID, ID5's Universal ID, and others.
And in addition, a lot of companies in the ID space are participating in other industry initiatives like the Advertising ID Consortium and the Secure Web Addressability Network, or SWAN. So another key, and, and this is a big one, is first-party data. So the whole privacy reset really brought to light the importance of first-party data. So companies with any D2C channel, whether it's a brand or a publisher or a media network or a retailer, they all want to leverage that data for targeting, for personalization, for attribution, for measurement. So the challenge is that outside of the giant walled gardens, that first party data is often limited in scale and it still needs to be matched with other online and sometimes offline data sets. And of course that needs to be done in a privacy uh, sensitive way. Um, DCRs are picking up steam as people realize the benefits of sharing information in anonymized privacy, privacy centric platforms and DCRs don't solve every identity challenge, but they are increasingly part of that post cookie mix, especially for buy side players. The CMO council found that only about 20% of marketers in North America had DCRs in Q2 of last year, but another 24% we're planning on adopting them. On the sell side, DCRs are also gaining, but they're inherently challenging, again, because of their costs, which I talked about a little earlier. And here's what Bob Waltzak from MadTech told us, quote, for publishers, it becomes challenging to prove the ROI of the clean room. If you have 20% penetration, apply any CPM you want to that and look at your revenue and it's not significant enough, end quote. Um, so Evelyn, what's your take on how DCRs will play out? And do you have any thoughts on this whole buyer versus seller dynamic? Yeah, what I'm finding in my research um, is that DCRs are very much on a path to becoming table stakes, really for, for all sides of the equation, buyers, sellers, and intermediaries. Um, and this is particularly true when it comes to measurement, like you mentioned a little bit earlier. Uh, and the IAB found recently that measurement use cases are less common uh, than more general kind of privacy compliance use cases like data anonymization. But generally speaking, despite the cost, uh, DCRs will become, like you mentioned, one of like well, the several essential tools for privacy compliant advertising stakeholders. Um, what I find a bit concerning is that smaller players are at a disadvantage here because of the upfront and ongoing cost of maintaining a DCR that may be out of reach for them. Yeah, absolutely. So let's talk about probabilistic solutions. So the Lotomy study I mentioned earlier found that 42% of marketers and publishers plan to use probabilistic solutions. And that was a big jump from 28% a year earlier. So this is one of many signs that the erosion of IDs is leading to a rethink of how consumers are targeted. So even though deterministic approaches are still prevalent, there's a lot of talk in the industry about layering in probabilistic data sets, or at least using hybrid solutions that uh, rely on both paradigms. And of course, the sudden surge of AI tools is only adding to the reconsideration of probabilistic solutions. And then there's the other uh, old concept that's getting a fresh look and that's contextual targeting. So to again cite the CMO council, they showed that roughly two thirds of marketers and customer experience professionals were planning to use contextual targeting to track and target customers. So yes, contextual presents some measurement challenges, but it was far and away the leading tactic in that CMO council survey. And here's a bit more on contextual targeting from advertiser perceptions. They found that 53% of marketers were currently using contextual and another 33% expected to start within a year. And this survey was fielded in Q2 of last year. So presumably by now, the use of contextual has increased quite a bit. And this confirms anecdotal input we hear from practitioners that in the absence of a robust and sort of universal identifier landscape, contextual is a, a good fallback option and that advancements in machine learning and AI are allowing for more precise and sophisticated contextual targeting. So while the cliche that everything old is new again applies here, 
You can also say that today's contextual is not your grandfather's contextual, just to beat another cliche into the ground there. Um, so that brings us to ponder the fate of IP addresses. Are they the next identifier on the chopping block? Well, they are specifically listed as PII by the GDPR and the California Consumer Privacy Act or CCPA. And there are several state laws and regulations in the books that maybe not as clear as or as specific about IP addresses as the CCPA, but they do suggest a similar approach. So on some level, IP addresses are in the crosshairs of regulators. Now that said, whether or not they'll go the way of browser cookies depends on who you ask. So for some, IP addresses will follow in the wake of uh, browser cookies. Bill Bruno of Data Solutions wrote a um, guest editorial that said, quote, the collection and use of third-party cookies is coming to an end and another internet tool will likely follow the IP address, end quote. He also argued that IP addresses reveal bits of PII that anyone with just a little bit of know-how can access. And that of course opens the way for misuse by bad actors. Now on the flip side, there are some prominent people in the industry who expect IP addresses to pretty much stay put, at least for now. And one of them is Andre Swanston from TransUnion. He wrote, quote, all signs point to the IP address sticking around for the time being. After all, the alarm bells signaling the demise of cookies have been ringing for a decade, end quote. Well, whatever happens, here's what we do know. The IP address battle will definitely play out in the fastest growing area of digital advertising, according to our forecasts, and that's CTV. Uh, so IP addresses are to CTV what third-party cookies were to web browsers and mobile IDs to smartphones. So the CTV ecosystem could be in line for the same reckoning that social platforms and marketers have faced in the wake of cookie and mobile ID deprecation. I think we'll hear a little bit more from Kyle on this, so stay tuned. Um, so now I'm gonna wind down my part of the presentation um, before we turn it over to Evelyn and Kyle and before the Q&A. And I would just wanna share some best practices for how to navigate this very fluid, very complex ID situation. So first, continue to test and learn with deterministic and probabilistic approaches. The biggest advantage of deterministic methodologies is their accuracy, while probabilistic data sets are generally regarded for their scalability. Most respondents in surveys that we've looked at chose a mix of the two, and we think that's a smart approach. Second, uh, don't wait for Google to do whatever it's going to do or not do. I know that they've gone back and forth quite a bit on their plans, but don't assume a boy who cried wolf scenario. It's better to be over-prepared than under-prepared for the cookie-free future. Plus, with all the restrictions that are already in place, thanks to Apple and others, there's plenty of incentive to get ahead of the next falling domino here. And I would say the same thing about uh, state and federal privacy laws in the US. As usual, California was the tip of the spear as the first state to enact privacy legislation that limits the use of PII uh, there's a similar law already in force in Virginia, and other privacy regulations will go into effect in Connecticut, Colorado, and Utah by the end of this year, and more are likely to follow in the future in other states. Now, on a federal level, there's the American Data Privacy and Protection Act, but it's in legislative limbo and probably won't pass, at least not anytime soon. But even still, the writing is on the wall that even without any kind of federal law, the U.S. is leaning toward protection of privacy at the expense of the ad industry. And this is a clear signal to everyone in the ad industry to be proactive in implementing new solutions to their targeting and measurement needs. Um, and before I go through the last of these four best practices, um, turning back to you, Evelyn, um, for some insight. So I know you'll be attending the IAB's policy and legal summit next week, and you'll also be covering legislation and regulation for us this year. So. Any thoughts to add on U.S. privacy laws? Well, in keeping with the you know actionable 
spirit here, I'll just encourage everyone to begin exploring supply path optimization initiatives, like we talked about a little bit earlier. Um, you know, aside from the time commitment, there really is no downside to auditing programmatic partnerships. Um, and there are, like you mentioned already, privacy laws in play that require a more thorough understanding of who has access to consumer data along the bid stream. And there are more bills um, in consideration by state legislators and the one the, by the federal legis legislators, like you mentioned. Um, and if there are any gaps in privacy compliance, it's best to identify them now because um, willful ignorance is not really a great defense <laughs> against any fines or lawsuits. Um, and what's more, there's there's likely you know, cost efficiencies to be found, or at the very least, information that can be used to inform any decisions made on the identity resolution front. Yep, thank you, great insights there. Um, so the last best practice I'll share is about IP addresses. And the message here, again, is to err on the side of being proactive and in some ways assuming the worst uh, in, in a good way. The jury is out on whether IP addresses will be the next uh, identifier to, to be eliminated, but in the interest of getting ahead of a potential disaster, decreasing your reliance on these identifiers, especially in IP address-centric environments like CTV, seems like a good call. And with that, back to you, Evelyn. Thanks, Paul. That was excellent. Um, before we dive into uh, our live Q&A, and we've had some great questions come in, so keep them coming, I would love to bring back our special guest from Axiom, Kyle Holloway, Senior Vice President and Head of Global Identity. Welcome again, Kyle. Hey, Evelyn. Thank you. And thank you, Paul. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here today. Sure is, isn't it? Uh, Kyle, before we get into some some questions for you, would you mind briefly explaining you know, who Axiom is for our attendees? Sure, happy to. Um, as you know, Axiom considers itself a customer intelligence cloud. You know, while we're not competing head to head with marketing clouds like Salesforce, Adobe, or Oracle, um, you know, we do have the data assets, the products and the expertise that the marketing clouds, even CDPs or SaaS platforms need in order for them to achieve higher levels of performance. You know, our identity solutions, our data and audience insights, platform solutions and analytics um, were all developed with the primary purpose of embedding that customer intelligence into a brand's marketing and advertising stack. So we know that customer intelligence is a foundation to acquire, grow and retain customers and to meet a brand's business objectives. So that's where Axiom has really been focused at this point in time. Excellent. Uh, so I have heard some brands um, kind of figuring out how to conceptualize, you know, what's going on with identity resolution. And some of them are arriving at the conclusion that it's yet another cost center to consider. Um, what would you what would you say to those brands? Well, I'd start by saying um, they need to really look at what's going on in the market, right? With all of the variance that's happening that Paul just uh, did a great job of kind of walking us through. The fact is that uh, enterprise identity management is the glue that is really holding the whole ecosystem together. It's the currency, uh, if you want to use that term, to transact upon. And so uh, it's very strategic. And it's not just in programmatic. It's not just uh, in a certain channel. It's actually across all the channels and across the entire enterprise. Um, you know, you have to look at identity holistically from ranging from customer service, operations, analytics, marketing, advertising, you know, getting identity right, meaning formulating the right understanding of a person, who that customer is across the channel or the touch point, greatly impacts all those other cost centers. So it's really more about optimizing your existing cost centers by getting identity right. So it's a great investment on the front end. Excellent. Um, here's a really, I love this question. What is the biggest obstacle that you've seen in working with clients when it comes to implementing an enterprise-wide identity solution? 
Yeah, I think the the biggest obstacle we've seen is really um, generating an awareness of the need to get consensus and buy in from across all areas of the business. Um, you know, typically it's been addressed in a siloed fashion. You know, within a particular division, as I was just mentioning, and the fact is. Each part of the business has a different view of who a person is, who a household is, and how to reach them. And especially when you start to extend that beyond your own walls and getting into like the ad tech ecosystem, those definitions really start to change. And so it's really important to get a holistic picture of that and uh, really focus on first party and get that first party identity solved for a common uh, you know, definition and view of who that is. And then look at those identity signals as they go across um, the ecosystem. Absolutely. It seems like for a lot of this, an introspective look, just looking at internally at one's own resources and goals is, is really the first step um, in a lot of ways. So uh, Paul listed a handful of best practices for navigating the complex and fragmented identity landscape as it currently exists. Um, do you have any any other best practices to share or any thoughts on the ones that Paul presented? Well, I wholeheartedly agree with Paul on all of his that he mentioned. And I think the first and foremost is to own it. You need to own identity and own your perspective of that as a business uh, because the ecosystem is fragmented. Different parties are using different methodologies. We talked about, you know, um, probabilistic versus deterministic, or if you're going into contextual, certainly if you're going into channels like CTV, all of those have kind of a different methodology and how they define identity. And so um, you can't just leave that to happenstance. You know, you really need to own that. You need to step into it, understand what's happening in each of those, and then look at your own requirements. You know, what are your goals and your use cases, and then optimize for that. So that may be looking at, am I looking for reach? Am I looking for precision? Am I looking for speed of access and being able to reach someone? And then picking the right partner and the right channel to go across. Awesome. Um, I have another kind of point that Paul brought up to run by you to get your thoughts on, um, and that's the IP address issue or the potential IP address issue. You know, where where do you stand on on IP addresses and whether or not they will be deprecated? Well, um, certainly the jury's out and I don't think there's a really a definitive signal to say definitively um, whether IP will be in or out. Certainly we have to take the practical view that you know, IP is organic to how the, inter in the internet operates. So certainly it's not just going to go away overnight there may be mechanisms to start to obfuscate that or to restrict access to it. But um, in a first party context, you're still gonna have access to it. Um, the reality is you need to look at what channels you're using and where it makes sense. Obviously CTV, uh, as Paul stated, is kind of gonna be the, the ground in which that battle's kind of gonna work its way out over the next couple of years. Um, because within CTV, it is the currency. You know, it's kind of the fiat currency for that ecosystem. As you're interacting with that, you have to make a recognition that IP is not um, particularly accurate in terms of people-based marketing. It's more of a household-based model. So if you're comfortable with doing more household-based um, advertising and understand the fidelity and the accuracy of that, then it's great. You know, it's going to be available for some time uh, within that ecosystem, but you have to not look at it as just a pure proxy to, oh, cookies are going away, then I'm just going to move over to IP. There's a lot of challenges, even with that viewpoint. And the fact is, yes, it is likely um, in certain channels going to become uh, more restricted or obfuscated. So looking at other means down the road, I think is critical. Excellent. Well, thank you, Kyle. Uh, it is time now to get into our audience Q&A, and we've received a lot of great questions. So let's dive on in. And this is a really fun one. So we'll start with a little bit of, of grading. So uh, Paul and Kyle 
if you had to give the industry a letter grade for how far along uh, we all are in being ready for the cookie-less future, what would that letter grade be? Let's start with Paul. Wow, nothing like putting both of us on the spot here. <laughs> well, I'm going to say a B. And the way I would rationalize that is um, there's a lot of progress still to be made. And I think a, there are a lot of companies that have gotten caught out um, really being underprepared and having their businesses suffer as a result of the uh, privacy reset and as uh, in anticipation of what we think will happen next. But I think there are signs of progress as I showed in, in some of the data. And, um, you know, I'll be optimistic that companies will take all of the signals there or, you know, read the tea leaves as they're happening now and and try to get ahead of, of the next wave. So I think there's a lot of energy toward solving for some of these issues before they become super, super critical. Great. I think I'm going to take a maybe a, a little uh, harder grading scale here. So I'm going to go with more like a, a B minus, a C plus. Um, and that's really based on the concepts within maybe the, the ecosystem players, I think is more advanced. But when it comes to the actual brands themselves, um, you know, I think there's still a lot of learning going on. I think there's a lot of um, consideration, but not a lot of execution yet along those paths. They're still like, hey, third party cookies are still here. So we're going to keep, you know, business as usual and we'll just kind of give some consideration to. So I think um, there's some catching up to do, some acceleration. You know, when Google kind of gave the reprieve for a period, it was, you know, other things were of concern, right? There's economic slowdowns. There's all kinds of other things going on. It's like, okay, I don't have to necessarily deal with that right now. And I think that's now starting to bubble back up a little bit of sense of urgency now that we're into 2023. So, All right. Well, that's still both passing grades. I'd say very respectable <laughs> for, for the industry. Yeah. Um, all right, Kyle, here's one for you. What is the most successful way that you've seen publishers tackle identity without cookies? Well, for publishers, I think it's really focusing on their first party assets, right? And really folks on building out their first party audiences and beginning to expose those sometimes through data clean rooms or through direct integrations um, so that they're able to monetize you know, that audience without the reliance on cookies and, and just make that exposed. So we've seen a lot of success in that space. Um, there's still work to be done, but uh, focusing on zero party data capture, taking that in, owning uh, the identity resolution to that, and then looking at targeted connectivity uh, on a, you know, more of a private basis. Awesome. Well, here's another one for both of you. Is it realistic to expect a universal identifier um, to, to come around that the industry can really rally around all together? <laughs> Paul, why don't we start with you? Sure. Yeah, I mean, I don't expect us to ever revert to a world where there was, you know, anything akin to the third party cookie uh, or the mobile ID. I, I mean, I made the analogy during the presentation to... TV ad measurement and what's going on there. I think that we, you know, in that world, you had Nielsen as a single currency that has eroded significantly. And now you've got this sort of wild west of testing and experimentation with a lot of different providers. And, you know, th I think there's something, th there's some energy toward rallying around certain concepts or certain um, industry sort of initiatives or in some cases, company-led initiatives, both on the identifier side and on the measurement side. But I think it's still, no matter what happens, we're gonna be looking at a future that is somewhat more fragmented than what we came from. Yeah, and I completely agree with that. I think, um, one, it's just the economics at play. There's a lot of money in the ecosystem, right? And, um, and somebody trying to come in with a, singular identifier and collectively agree to that just as problematic of how that will be monetized, managed. There's a lot of players. You have the walled gardens, you have the rise of the retail media networks, you have 
data clean rooms with their, um, you know, ability to share data um, in a more privacy compliant way. So I think it's going to stay fragmented. I think there's going to be some consensus built ultimately on maybe a collection of either identifiers or or first party uh, IDs and um, data points, you know, hashed emails, things like that, that can be managed in a privacy compliant manner that are somewhat ubiquitous, but there's still going to be a lot of exchange of IDs within those disparate ecosystems. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, on that point of there being a kind of handful of, of solutions, maybe that everyone will arrive at, and it might look different from advertiser to advertiser or from publisher to publisher. Um, we got a question about, about how to go about testing um, more than one identity solution at a time, and specifically deterministic and probabilistic identity solutions at the same time, and whether that would be a recommended approach. Um, what do you think, Paul? Yeah, I mean, I think um, the more you test, the more you're going to come up with a solution that works for you. And, you know, one thing about this landscape is that there is no one size fits all. I mean, every one of these environments where programmatic and digital advertising takes place is extremely different. I mean, it's very different to uh, target an audience on TikTok than it is on connected TV or on a publisher news site or even on another social platform like uh, Instagram. So approaches are gonna vary. They're also gonna vary by brand and what the brand objectives are. So there's just so much range here that I think what you need to do, uh, no matter what part of the ecosystem you're in, is figure out wh what you want for your business and then avail yourself of solutions that are out there or test solutions that are out there, but just, do it with an open mind and with an understanding that, you know, everybody's kind of in the same boat. You know, nobody has the answers. That's why we're all here talking about this stuff because we're trying to figure it out. So uh, I think more is better when it comes to testing. I, I know it's easier said than done and it is costly and time consuming and a lot of things go by as you're testing, but I think it's really important. Kyle, do you have anything to add there? Oh, man, I would totally agree. I mean, that's what we encourage our customers to do. Um, I think the biggest challenge in it outside of, you know, just the time and economics of of doing more testing is defining the measure. How are you going to measure that test? Uh, because as you lose those uh, signals, you may not be able to, you know, capture the same identifier uh, inbound as you had outbound. And so you've got to do some, uh, you know, some math there to figure out how those correlate together. Um, so that's that's really it. It's just you're going to have to take a a disciplined approach, understand your measurements up front, but then yes, test multiple um, because as Paul said, we're all in this together, and there is no one size fits all. Absolutely. Well, on that note about no one size fits all, and Paul, you kind of alluded to this, how targeting looks different in different ecosystems. Um, how does identity resolution differ for mobile as opposed to CTV? Are there any nuances that that you can kind of uh, shed some light on for us, Paul? Well, I mean, I think at the core, you know, mobile is more of a um, you know, um, personal device, whereas CTV is more of a household-based device. So the identifiers that work best in each case are different and, you know, um, they have their pros and cons. I mean, within mobile and within CTV, there's quite a bit of range. Um, so again, it's hard to generalize, but I mean, I would say that most marketers are in a position where they're not looking discreetly at one of these channels versus another. So, it, you know, you can't really say to them, well, just focus on what's going to work for CTV, because what if they're also, you know, if their campaign is extending out to TikTok and, and YouTube. So I think, you, again, it, it gets back to what I said earlier about just understanding what your objectives are what those channels look like in terms of the technology around them and in terms of how people access those devices. And then, um, you know, just do your best at triangulating a solution that's going to hit as many of the targets as, as you can hit. 
Absolutely. Well, we have time for one more here. Um, let's see what y'all have un under the hood here about um, what you're seeing as the most effective uses of first party data. I'm sure you've both seen some really creative uses of this data that has taken on so much additional value in this new identity landscape. Um, Kyle, let's start with you. Yeah, so most effective use of first party data. I mean, it's it's really being able to uh, capture the right data to bring it in and really be able to get it down to resolving to the level of accuracy and precision that you're looking for within the business, usually, you know, at the individual level, but also getting household level signals and being able to tie those together and then being able to spread those across the enterprise uh, through a centralized identity resolution service enterprise level so that even just internally, you can begin sharing those insights. So if you're engaging with a consumer on two different channels, you have that same level of uh, identity that's feeding that, that's based off of that first party insights. And then uh, obviously working very close with those direct connections. We've seen some really uh, increased rates of, um, of match rates and effectiveness when you take that first party audience, take those signals and go directly uh, either into the SSP or even into the retail media network and say, hey, let's do a, a PII-based match of that first party data to the first party data at the publisher and uh, really start, you know, you can get some really good match rates doing that, which uh, historically you've kind of lost that signal when, you know, you've gone through more of the traditional paths of pseudonym pseudonymity and, and device. All right, take us home, Paul. <laughs> yeah, and I would just pick up on something that Kyle pointed out and, and that's retail media networks. I think that's a space where really this, uh, big, uh, I know we overuse the word juggernaut, but like when we look at, at retail media advertising, it's really just going gangbusters. Um, it's grown very, very fast and it's short of CTV. It's it's the fastest, it's the second fastest uh, growing ad format that we see. And it's really powered primarily by the strength of that first party data that retailers and brands have and can leverage in that very transaction oriented uh, set up. So, I mean, I think first party data is prevalent across a lot of different parts of the ecosystem. And sometimes it's not even a matter of scale. It's a matter of how well you know your customer and how organized you are about preserving and leveraging that data. But when it comes to sort of like the macro picture of what first party data is doing within digital advertising, I would point to retail media as as a uh, an indicator that uh, that this is really important. You know that first party data is critically important. Absolutely. Well, unfortunately, that is all we have time for today. Thanks again to Paul for joining us, and a very special thanks to Kyle and to the team at Axiom. Uh, also, our eMarketer production crew behind the scenes deserves a huge thank you for making today's webinar possible. We quite literally could not do it without them. Uh, as promised, we will be emailing you a link to today's slides along with a full recording of the session. Uh, so keep an eye on your inbox for that. And before we wrap up, let me take a moment to tell you what's happening across eMarketer's media channels. Uh, you can register for upcoming live analyst webinars and tech talk webinars at emarketer.com slash webinars. On the audio side, uh, don't forget to tune in to Behind the Numbers, which is our, our daily podcast, which you can find anywhere that you listen to podcasts. And finally, please check out our newsletters. We have a couple of options across retail, finance, digital advertising. So there's something for everyone. And if you haven't already signed up, you can do so at emarketer.com slash newsletters. Thank you again for joining us and enjoy the rest of your workday.